Welcome to Wider View, the program that provides perspectives on the news outside the narrow confines of the mainstream media. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. I had planned to have Catherine Schachtem on the show this week, but due to issues with her travel schedule, coupled with the eight-hour time difference between Oregon and England, we were unable to find a mutually agreeable time to talk. So I'm going to provide answers to a number of the questions that the U.S. corporate media and our politicians have either failed to ask or asked incorrectly about the recent assassination of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani by the United States. I'll start with the timeline of events and then talk about who this man Soleimani was and why he was killed and then reflect uh, on the motivations of the various players in this crisis and what's likely in the near future. The current escalation in hostilities by the United States began after an attack on an Iraqi military base in Kirkuk on December 27th. While the base, called K-1, is an Iraqi base, U.S. and foreign contractors are stationed there as well. An Iraqi-born U.S. contractor who was acting as an interpreter, Nawaz Hamid, was killed in the attack. It's still not clear who was responsible for the attack. The U.S. was quick to claim the attack was undertaken by an Iran-backed militia, although those militias, known as Popular Mobilization Units, or PMU, are currently integrated with the Iraqi army. The U.S. military claimed 100% confidence that the attack was carried out by one of the PMUs called Kataib Hezbollah, and later claimed to know that Iranian General Qasem Soleimani personally approved the attack. Well, to date, no evidence has been provided that would back up this claim. Kataib Hezbollah, no relation to the well-known Lebanese organization, has been closely identified with and supplied by Iran and in the last few years has had a prominent role in the fight against the Islamic State in both Iraq and Syria. In August of last year, a spokesman for Kataib Hezbollah told a Lebanese news site that recent air raids on Iraqi popular mobilization units were planned by the United States with Israeli support in order to weaken Iraqi resistance and prepare for the return of thousands of ISIS terrorists to the Iraqi-Syrian border. While Khatib Hezbollah was opposed to the continuing U.S. occupation of Iraq and may have been involved in the December 27th attack, the U.S. has yet to offer any evidence proving that. Also, since the defeat of ISIS in Iraq was announced, there's no valid reason for U.S. troops to remain in the country. Two days after the Kirkuk attack, the U.S. bombed three sites in Iraq and two sites in Syria that they said were tied to Kataib Hezbollah. 31 people were killed in those attacks and as many as 50 wounded. In a press conference after the attack, PMU Commander Qasim Musle said the brigades targeted by the United States were under his command and had not been involved in any action against the U.S. They protect the border between Iraq and Syria. Iraqi President Barham Salih condemned that U.S. action as a violation of Iraqi sovereignty, which it obviously was. The United States is in Iraq officially at the request of the Iraqi government to assist in the fight against the Islamic State. For them to bomb an Iraqi military base and kill soldiers of the Iraqi armed forces is unconscionable. Iraq's caretaker Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi said that the bombing of the PMU bases, quote, is a dangerous aggravation which endangers the security of Iraq and the region, end quote. Obviously, he was correct. Commander Qasim Musle, in an interview on the night of that attack, said the attack had been expected. He said, quote, We had heard a lot of discussions about the United States and Israel planning to attack. They want to make our institutions weaker after their attempts at a coup failed, end quote. Muslim said that the United States and Israel had sent people to push for the fall of the Iraqi government in the recent protests. 
A funeral procession was held in Baghdad on Tuesday, December 31st for the victims of the U.S. air raids that had killed 31 PMU fighters. And President, Prime Minister rather, Abdul Mahdi announced three days of public mourning. Thousands of angry demonstrators gathered outside the gates of the huge U.S. Embassy compound in Baghdad's Green Zone to condemn the U.S. aggression, shouting death to America and burning U.S. flags. Reuters reported that the ambassador and key staff had been evacuated and only a few protection staff were left behind. The protesters did breach the outer wall of the high-security compound and sprayed the words, closed in the name of the people, on the gates throwing bricks and stones at surveillance cameras. Both American forces inside the compound and Iraqi security forces outside fired tear gas and stun grenades into the crowd in order to disperse them, but the protesters remained defiant and a group of them stormed and burned a security post at the embassy entrance. Well, given the total disregard for Iraqi sovereignty by the United States and the killing of over 30 of their citizens, it's not difficult to understand why many Iraqis are demanding that the U.S. leave. Here's a commentary recorded after the embassy demonstrations by Iranian-born scholar Kaveh Afrasiabi, who has been a guest on this program in the past. He spoke on CCTV America on January 2nd. If you recall, first of all, a couple of months ago when Iran's consulate in Najaf uh, was torched by some suspicious provocateurs, the U.S., uh, you know, clapped hands and, and welcomed the news. And now they're probably getting a bit of their own medicine after violating Iraq's uh, sovereignty and engaging in a unilateral military action based on the flimsiest excuses without providing a shred of evidence that that particular militia was indeed behind that rocket attack against their military base. And so the U.S. continues to have military intervention in Iraq a decade and a half after its false pretext of, uh, you know, WMD in 2003. Uh, and there's probably a connection with the impeachment threat to the presidency of uh, President Trump, who probably thought that he can look presidential by standing up to the bad old Iranians, and it has clearly backfired and caused a severe setback in U.S.-Iraq relations, turning Iraq basically into a tinderbox and a, and a ticking time bomb. And unless the U.S. reconsiders its misguided policy toward Iran as well as Iraq, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that the situation will deteriorate further and get into unwanted scenarios. Well, as Dr. Kava Afrasiabi predicted, we did get into unwanted scenarios, to say the least. Iraqi Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi, responding to the escalating tensions in the region, particularly between Iran and Saudi Arabia, was acting as an intermediary for Saudi attempts to de-escalate the situation through diplomacy. General Qasem Soleimani traveled to Baghdad on January 2nd to deliver the Iranian response to a message the Iraqi government had delivered on behalf of the Saudis. Soleimani flew into Baghdad International Airport on a commercial flight from Damascus on a Cham Wings Airbus A320. According to the Jerusalem Post, two Cham Wings employees, one a spy at the Damascus airport and the other working on board the plane, tipped off Israeli intelligence and the CIA. Another two security staffers at the Baghdad airport notify the U.S. military when the aircraft arrive. Soleimani was met at the airport by Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, a key leader of the Iraqi Popular Mobilization Forces. A U.S. Air Force MQ-9 Reaper drone was loitering above the area, and when Soleimani and al-Muhandis departed the airport at 12.47 a.m. on the morning of January 3rd, they struck the convoy on the Baghdad Airport Road, killing 10 people, including both Soleimani and al-Muhandis, along with four other officers of the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps and four other members of the Iraqi Popular Mobilization Forces. 
According to NBC and the Washington Post, President Trump authorized the murder of Soleimani seven months ago if the death of an American was attributed to Iran. The Trump administration claimed that there was evidence that Soleimani was planning an imminent attack on U.S. assets in the region, but no evidence has been presented either to Congress or the American people up to today to back up that claim. Trump also authorized the murder of the Iranian commander in Yemen, Abdul Reza Shalai, but that attempt failed. As described by the Washington Post, and I quote, Trump, his brain addled by Benghazi-itis, that is, a desire to look tougher than former President Barack Obama did during the Benghazi attacks, ordered the killing of Soleimani and apparently Shalai, even though the intelligence indicated that Iran did not intend to escalate. The Post article continued, so Soleimani was originally on Trump's target list in keeping with an agenda that John Bolton and Mike Pompeo had been dreaming about for many months. And Trump seems to have ordered a broader operation against Iranian military leaders than anybody knew. And not in response to any genuinely imminent threat. This is nothing like the story we've been told, which raises serious questions about the legality of the killing. End quote. It's refreshing to see an article, even an opinion article like that one, in the mainstream media questioning the legality of this drone murder. Of course, had the murder been ordered by a Democratic president, there probably would have been no questions asked, whatever. So who was this man, General Qasem Soleimani? Author and historian Kevin Barrett was interviewed by Marzia Hashemi on Press TV and attempted to make this clear to people of the United States. Uh, I've tried to explain this to my fellow U.S. Americans by bringing in comparisons, because most of them haven't even heard of General Soleimani, who's really the greatest military figure of the 21st century. And people in the region know that. But here in the United States, you know, we don't know much beyond our borders. So I've been trying to make these comparisons to say, well, imagine if in 1946 uh, Stalin had, on the very same day, uh, managed to succeed in assassinating uh, George Patton, Douglas MacArthur, and Dwight David Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. uh, just imagine how the United States uh, would have reacted. The American people would have demanded the destruction of Stalin and the Soviet Union, and they would have probably been willing to embark on a very long-term project to make sure that happened, and uh, they would have been willing to sacrifice quite a lot. But even that comparison doesn't do justice to this situation because for all of their heroism in their legendary defeat of an enemy portrayed as the embodiment of absolute evil in World War II, which is where the popularity of those generals came from, um, General Soleimani has not only uh, defeated a genuinely absolute evil, that is Daesh and uh, their Zionist friends, but uh, he also is a very pure, holy, and pious man, quite unlike those American generals, and has that religious dimension in a culture that is taught that martyrdom is the highest possible state that, you know, all Muslims, and I'm one, know that the best possible death is a martyr's death, it's fighting, struggling to defend your people against an unjust, uh, aggressive tyranny. And so the resolve, not only of the Iranian nation, because General Soleimani was not only loved and respected by all Iranians, essentially, the Poles showed he was by far the most popular figure in Iran, uh, whatever people's views on all kinds of other issues in Iran, even the tiny minority that still likes the Shah, which is you have to look pretty far in Iran before you find any of them, even those people love Soleimani. Everybody in Iran loves Soleimani, but not just in Iran, all across the region. Uh, he's... Very, very, he was very popular in Iraq, despite the ranta mobs that the Americans brandished. Uh, he was very popular elsewhere. He's very popular in Saudi Arabia. Sure, the leaders don't like him, and the brainwashed Wahhabis don't like him, but ordinary people throughout the region admire this guy because uh, both he's Islamically very pious and uh, pure, a warrior monk, a strategic genius. You know, he won a victory, and now he's been martyred by... What, what can we call people like Trump? What can we call them indeed?
In another Press TV interview, Saad Shas talked about the military accomplishments of Soleimani. In this conversation, he uses the term Daesh instead of ISIS and refers to the terrorists as Takfiri groups. Takfiri refers to the religious fundamentalism born in Saudi Arabia that rejects and marks for death anyone who does not share their specific beliefs. Qasem Suleiman stepped in and filled the gap uh, in there and they, suddenly we have a very strong armed militias who defeated Daesh and saved Iraq. The same thing goes hand in hand was in the fight in Syria. The same thing in Lebanon. If he wasn't involved in supporting the Lebanese resistance in there, uh, Lebanon won't be uh, the same today would be controlled by Takfiri groups. This is what led the cooperation, as the ABC News said, the American ABC News said, between the Israelis, Mossad, and the Americans in tracking this man who, formidable man, who stopped them uh, from dominating the region through these takfiri groups. And uh, I want to add, we remember the casualties of Daesh in south of Syria. These Israel made for them makeshift hospitals in the uh, and treated them and bashed them up and sent them back to fight the Syrian people. The Daesh destroyed over 180,000 houses in Iraq alone, inflicted the unbelievable destruction in, in, in the country, worth over $600 billion of uh, damage in the infrastructure. Thus, in Iraq, looting its oil and the smuggling the oil out of the country under the watchful eyes of the United States of America. If they wanted to deny Daesh and they were fighting it, they should have stopped the smuggling at least. And when we see Daesh and the alliance of the United States of America fighting in the, in, in, in the grounds of Iraq, they fight for one purpose, to destroy the country. Soleimani provided important help to the United States after the September 11th attacks by helping U.S. forces locate and attack Taliban forces in Afghanistan. When ISIS threatened to overrun Iraq in 2011, the country might have fallen had Soleimani not organized and directed militias to fight them and push them back. Of course, Soleimani did these things not because of any love of the United States, but because he believed strongly that the people of the region should be able to decide their own fate without interference from foreign powers. He not only was instrumental in the defeat of ISIS in Iraq, he helped the Syrian government defeat the U.S. and Saudi proxies who terrorized that nation over the last six years. Soleimani also provided invaluable assistance to the Lebanese militia in defeating the Israeli invasion in 2006. And he worked with the Yemeni government to fight off the brutal invasion by the Saudis with U.S. assistance. Soleimani was not a terrorist. The United States the Israelis, and the Saudis are the supporters, funders, and suppliers of terrorist forces throughout the Middle East and Central Asia. The assassination of Soleimani was just the most recent and most overt act of lawless terrorism by the United States. The UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killing, Agnes Calamard, has called on the United Nations to establish an impartial inquiry into the lawfulness of the Soleimani killing and the events leading up to it. She stated that a U.S. drone strike that killed him was most likely a violation of international law, saying the drone murder, quote, appears far more retaliatory for past acts than anticipatory for imminent self-defense. Lawful justifications for such killings are very narrowly defined, and it's hard to imagine how any of those definitions can apply to these killings, end of quote. And that assessment did not take into account the information that General Soleimani was in Baghdad on a diplomatic mission. Any individual acting as a diplomat for their country has complete immunity, regardless of any alleged wrongdoing they may have committed. Killing another nation's diplomats or high government officials is never permitted under international law, particularly when your nation is not at war with the other and you are carrying out your extrajudicial execution on the territory of another sovereign state without their permission. 
the number of international laws violated by the United States on the early morning of January 3rd boggles the mind. Trying to decipher the motivations of U.S. leaders is a difficult task. I think it's safe to say that President Trump knows absolutely nothing about geopolitics, military strategy, foreign policy, international law, or diplomacy. His motivations are to make himself look good and to get himself re-elected rather than be thrown out of office through impeachment. Numerous analysts have said that Trump makes up his mind based on the last person he talked to. We know that many of those closest to Trump, both inside and outside the administration, are rabid neoconservative Zionists. That would include Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, Mike Esper, John Bolton, Elliot Abrams, and major funders like Sheldon Adelson and Bernard Marcus. That makes it highly likely that the last foreign policy message received by Trump was more oriented to Israeli national interests than to U.S. national interests. Trump sees himself as a deal maker, and he often asks allies for more money or tries to extract money and resources from other nations under the threat of force. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard made this point effectively in a recent TV ad. Here's an excerpt. Trump disgraces our military by using our men and women in uniform as mercenaries, serving the interests of multinational corporations like ExxonMobil and foreign countries like Saudi Arabia. Now, for political reasons, he claims he is against so-called endless wars, but he supports and is carrying out 19th and 20th century style naked imperialism. In October of 2019, Trump began our occupation of Syrian oil fields using the excuse that he was protecting the oil from ISIS. But he revealed his real reason is to prevent the Syrian people from having access to their own oil. What he really was considering was to plunder the oil in partnership with ExxonMobil or some other multinational corporation. On October 27th, 2019 regarding Syria, he said, quote, We are leaving soldiers to secure the oil. Now, we may have to fight for the oil. That's okay. Maybe somebody else wants the oil, in which case they have a hell of a fight. It can help us because we should be able to take some also. And what I intend to do, perhaps, is make a deal with an ExxonMobil or one of our great companies to go in there and do it properly. But after our military leaders objected to his portrayal of our troops as essentially mercenaries who are pillaging the wealth of another country, Trump backed off. But then, just last Friday night, he again revealed his real motives for occupying Syria's oil fields, telling Laura Ingram, You know what I did? I left troops to take the oil. I took the oil. The only troops I have are taking the oil. They're protecting the oil. I took over the oil. We're taking the oil. We're not taking the oil. Well, maybe we will. Maybe we won't. They're protecting the facility. I don't know. Maybe we should take it. But we have the oil right now. The United States has the oil. By the way, what Trump is describing here is called pillaging under international law, and you guessed it, it's prohibited. Perhaps the best analysis of U.S. motivations in the Middle East that I've seen recently was provided by economist Michael Hudson, writing for the Vineyard of the Saker. Hudson says, and this is an excerpt of a much longer article, but I quote, The assassination of Soleimani was intended to escalate America's presence in Iraq to keep control of the region's oil reserves and to back Saudi Arabia's Wahhabi troops, ISIS, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, al-Nusra, and other divisions of what are actually America's foreign legion, to support U.S. control of Near Eastern oil as a buttress to the U.S. dollar. That remains the key to understanding this policy and why it is in the process of escalating, not dying down. End quote. Hudson goes on to explain, quote, The problem facing America's military strategists was how to continue supporting the 800 U.S. military bases around the world and Allied troop support without losing America's financial leverage. The solution turned out to be replacing gold with U.S. Treasury securities as the basis of foreign central bank reserves. 
After 1971, foreign central banks had little option for what to do with their continuing dollar inflows except to recycle them to the U.S. economy by buying U.S. Treasury securities. The effect of U.S. foreign military spending thus did not undercut the dollar's exchange rate and did not even force the Treasury and Federal Reserve to raise interest rates to attract foreign exchange to offset the dollar outflows on military account. In fact, U.S. foreign military spending helped finance the domestic U.S. federal budget deficit. Saudi Arabia and other Near Eastern OPEC countries quickly became a buttress of the dollar. So maintaining the dollar as the world's reserve currency became a mainstay of U.S. military spending. Foreign countries did not have to pay the Pentagon directly for this spending. They simply financed the U.S. Treasury and the U.S. banking system. Without the dollar's function as the vehicle for world saving, in effect without the Pentagon's role in creating the treasury debt that is the vehicle for world central bank reserves, the U.S. would find itself constrained militarily and hence diplomatically constrained as it was under the gold exchange standard. That's the same strategy that the U.S. has followed in Syria and Iraq. Iran was threatening this dollarization strategy and its buttress in U.S. oil diplomacy, so this strategy will continue until foreign countries reject it. If Europe and other regions fail to do so, they will suffer the consequences of this U.S. strategy in the form of a rising U.S.-sponsored war via terrorism, the flow of refugees, accelerated global warming, and extreme weather." End quote. Well, I have to say that President Trump is providing one benefit to the world, however. He's demonstrating that the U.S. is not a reliable partner, that the U.S. is not capable of making and keeping an agreement, that the United States has no regard for international law, and that the U.S. is focused on grabbing the Earth's resources for itself. The more these messages sink in, and they sink in much easier under President Trump than under under President Obama and some of our other more articulate presidents, other nations will, by necessity, have to move away not only from the U.S. politically, but from the U.S. dollar. And as they do so, they will move the only place they can move, which is toward Russia and China and the dollar will begin to go down in value, thus threatening everything about our nation's economy and certainly our nation's military strength. So that's kind of why we are here now in the Middle East and why we have gone so far as to kill General Qasem Soleimani and why we are still at war with Iran, and why we demonize Russia and China. There's a lot more to be said about this, but I think we'll leave that for another time. As always, the views expressed here are those of myself and my guests and may not reflect the views of the management of this radio station. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. Thanks for listening.